Hello, ghouls and goblins. Welcome back to Bride of Alternate Ending. I'm Brennan Klein. I'm here as ever with Tim Brayton. Hi, Tim. How's it going? It's going good. Thank you for well, thank you for having me. But it's it's sort of my my show that I co-host. But thank you for for having. Thank me you for show. having me. You know, as co-hosts, yes. we have each other. <laughs> we do. Um, we do. But yes, if you tuned in last week to our first official main feed, free for the people. We're we're uh, socializing this podcast. Um, if you were uh, atten- in attendance for that episode, um, Tim showed me a classic spooky film that I had not seen before, and now I'm returning the favor. Um, we have accidentally formulated a double feature of grief, uh, parental grief. Yes. The, the the levels of madness to which you are drawn when your little daughter is horribly killed. <laughs> Or dies horribly. Mm-hmm, pretty much. Uh, so yeah, we are here to talk about the 1980 Peter Medak uh, haunted house film, The Changeling. You may know Peter Medak from nothing. I mean, I'm sure that he's a fine, fine, upstanding member of the community. No, I mean, he directed Species too. so yes. Ah, okay. and, so maybe I'm wrong. A, a lot of... 70s movies that no one's heard of and a lot of TV is where where he's he's living. Okay. And and I will say and we'll, we'll maybe get into this. This feels like a little bit in a good way what happens when a TV director is given a movie. Like it has a kind of rough and tumble quality that feels like a 70s made for TV horror film. Oh yeah, but we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Um since I did the plot summary of the previous film Don't Look Now, um, you as the changeling neophyte, uh, the duty falls upon you this time. So what are what are we I, looking at here? I would be very very happy to to introduce us to the the, the film The Changeling. So this is a uh, a film from 1980 that starts with uh, George C. Scott, who is playing the character of John Russell. He's a composer who's just moved uh, to the Pacific Northwest. Um, his wife and daughter have died i think it's sort of implied to be the previous winter uh in a just horrible freak car accident and to to deal with his grief to deal with his feeling of isolation and loneliness uh john has moved all the way across country all the way to to seattle uh where he is set up in a large victorian mansion uh with the help the help of a local historian and uh Gets there, things seem to be okay. You know, he's trying to get his feet back underneath him. He's teaching composing classes at a, a local school. He's a he's a music composer. And little things start to happen, as they will, in, in his house. Like little switches being turned and banging things that shouldn't be banging. And he starts to see images of a, a dead child. Like just flashes of a dead child in his house. Uh, so he he gets to thinking perhaps he's got a haunting going on, and and indeed it turns out that he does, and he he brings in a medium to sort of try and communicate with the ghost, which appears to be uh, that of a a girl who was killed uh, in a very similar fashion to his own daughter uh, in 1909, and the medium comes and starts communicating with the ghost of this child, and it turns out uh, to be far stranger than just a a lonely little ghost and i think to go beyond that would get into spoiler territory so we will probably get there eventually but but for right now i think let's let's not traipse all over what exactly the identity of this this ghostly child turns out to be and why why they are haunting this particular house i think that's the right move probably and obviously we'll, we'll tell you before we dive into spoiler territory which we will at some point um, we got it. Yeah, but it is it is very much a, you know, in a lot of ways, many haunted house movies are you know mysteries about discovering the nature and origin of the ghost. But this is very much a marriage of haunted house and kind of mystery procedural. It it is definitely in most haunted house movies, the mystery is just about how do we learn what the ghost wants so we can get rid of it. This one is much more about how do we learn 
who the ghost is so we can discover how this is playing out in the world of the living right now as we speak. Yes. And and it is. And also I would argue it what? Is, I was going to say it is potentially not going too far into spoiler territory, although if you want to have your your virgin ears completely untouched, skip the next few seconds. Uh this this turns out to actually be a combination of haunted house movie and and sort of like a 70s paranoia political thriller. Yeah, it's it's an interesting combination for you know, for insofar as it is an extremely classical example of a haunted house film. Um, but the the things that creep in around the edges are very interesting subgenres. Yes. Um but yeah, and I would also argue that the the mystery is a way for George C. Scott's character to kind of channel his his grief and distract his mind by getting really invested in this project more than anything Mm -hmm. and that seems to be a probably a major contributing factor to why he even stays in the house because it like at an probably about halfway through the film he's he's basically at the point where he should not be living there anymore I, I yes would completely agree with and that. his uh his liaison with the uh historical housing office who's played by his uh his real life wife uh, Trish Vandeveer um she's she literally says you need to leave that house and then it just cuts to him in the house again <laughs> mhm um but anyway so but no yeah. I I think that's that's exactly correct and it's not it's not quite as much as don't look now was like just a film about grief like there's other stuff in there but that's certainly his character is about grief. His character is actually a very similar arc to the one that, that Donald, uh, Donald Sutherland undergoes in Don't Look Yes, that's very true. But also, you know, saying that a movie is less about grief than Don't Look Now is like saying uh, that it's less about, you know, shiny red rain slickers than Don't Look Now. Like it, it, Oh, yeah, no. Don't Look Now is about no other thing than grief, yeah. and this is about other things than grief. So, if anything, this is the more expansive film. Exactly. Okay, so this this is the first time watch for you. What was your... It like, is. Credits are rolling. What What's your takeaway on The Changeling? Uh, my takeaway is that I learned directly before starting, because I, I I streamed it on, on the streaming service Vudu, uh, whose description of the film included a specific word that I had not previously learned about this this film, The Changeling, and that word was Canadian. Ha! Uh-huh. And and as it started to play in front of me, and by the time it was over, uh, longtime readers and, and hopefully longtime listeners will know that I have a, a curiously insistent belief that Canada just makes better horror movies than other people. They are more... They are more anchored in the human and the sort of character arcs of those involved, and they, they become much more sort of domestic stories that are also spooky and scary rather than just machines to dispense jump scares. Uh, the Changeling certainly does not challenge that belief of mine. This is an exemplar of why Canadian horror, I think, is just so much richer and and more psychologically expressive than than other uh, other horror genres. I. I think for part of partially because of the amount of non haunted house material that starts coming into the film as it goes along, I'd be very hard pressed to say that I I thought it was a scary movie, but it is certainly a very good movie that uses the material of a haunting house in a very thoughtful and effective way. I well, first of all, I'm I'm very glad to hear that you liked it because obviously this is the one that I I brought to you and you were. Fully in your right to not like it, given what what I did with "Don't Look Now." I mean, I I, I wasn't I wasn't gonna do a quid pro quo. Mm. Um, but no, I I think you're right. Although I would argue that, yeah, I I don't know the the changeling. It's I think it's it obviously suffers from not being the haunting, um, and for assembling a lot of similar and and in the same way that no film is about grief as much as "Don't Look Now." No haunted house movie is as much fuck me up and get under my skin as the haunting, so that's not a problem. Yeah, like that, that's not a that's not a demerit, um, but it, it's doing things that other things have done better. But it's doing them extremely well. It's basically mm-hmm. like um, the the thing that James Wan does in The Conjuring. If James Wan had any chill, um, because mm, the Changeling like 
is very much an assemblage of extremely hoary haunted house tropes. Um, but just in an, in a very effective way, but less, less jump scare focused. It's much more classical and elegant still. Right. And, and I think a big part of that is because, I mean, this is a George C. Scott vehicle. George C. Scott is not a scream queen. He's an Oscar winning actor at this point. Uh, the film automatically becomes more about John as a character and John's grief. It's again, sort of in a very don't look now way. Um, so I, I think even as it's deploying all of these like very, very well-worn haunted house mm. tropes, I never get the feeling it's trying to like snooker me. It's not like, Ooh, the water just turned on. It's like, it's always about him. It's always about how he's processing mm-hmm. this. So the fact that these are cliches almost to a certain extent doesn't hit me because that's, they, they are cliches in service to a character arc, not cliches in service to trying to like jump out at me and go boom. Yeah. And that's a good point. So, and also, you know, so we're viewing it through the filter of him and, George C. Scott isn't particularly scared of what's happening. Um, no, he's curious. Yeah, he's curious, and it's giving him something to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I I will say that for me, the uh, one thing that does kind of get my blood pumping is the seance scene. I yes, I knew we were going to talk about the seance scene because it is so good. It's incredible. I for me, I would. At least of the things that I've seen, which is a lot of things, it's my number one seance scene in a film. I I find it incredibly effective. I think the way that it builds the rhythm of the scene on the soundtrack is unparalleled. The soundtrack is really great. The so so those of you who have not seen the film, um, seance scene obviously they happen in, in movies of this sort. Uh, but the the medium in this case is sort of I forget what the, the word for it is, but she's kind automatic of automatic writing. Automatic writing, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, so she's just kind of like scrawling on a piece of paper, and her assistant is pulling the paper away. She's filling it up, uh, and and the scene I think very successfully withholds the camera angles on what she's doing until such time as the soundtrack has sort of gotten us keyed up enough that that when the camera then points down over her hands and like, we see what she's doing with her hands and she's just kind of like frantically scrolling outwards. Uh, it's very well paced to make that hit really, really hard. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that that's on the camera side. And then on, on the audio side, you're getting this very distinct rhythm of her scratching with the, pe- with the pencil and then the, the paper being kind of flipped out um, from the pad. So it's like, <laughs> And it gets faster it's and faster. It's very stressful. Yeah, it's a very stressful sounding sequence. It just your your shoulders will rise to your ears, like through the process of how it just keeps building and building. For real, especially because, like, as you say, it gets faster and faster, and it almost becomes like, is she going to run out of paper? Like, how how it's just she's violently attacking the paper. It's just very very shocking. Uh, really great sequence. Um, is it the best seance sequence I've ever seen would be a question I would want to live with. I, and these films are even potentially further away from this film is even further than horror from horror than the changeling is in some ways. Uh, seance on a wet afternoon might, might still get my, my number one slot. And I haven't seen that movie, so I'll, I'll allow it. All right. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but yeah, for for me, I mean, I just I, I love I love the rhythms of it, and also you're right that the the automatic writing is an important part of it, but also it's not something you see in a lot of typical uh, seance scenes in films. Um, right. So it really carves out its own space, even among all the the kind of more classical tropes in the movie. It's I, I just find mm-hmm. it really, it's it's the thing that I think about most in that movie, and there are several scenes that are iconic in the changing, but that's the one that I always return to. I mean that is certainly I think it is it is it is the most classically scary scene I think or at least the most tense scene like it's the one like as you said you you just start cringing your body starts like folding up in on itself when you're watching this uh so in that respect I think it's clearly one of the standout scenes um the the one honestly right off the right off the jump the film was starting to uh to really wall up me I thought the scene where the wife and daughter die was uh was shocking I was not ready for it to be as sort of crude and blunt about what cars 
do when they run over people. I mean, not like we, we don't see anything. There's not blood. There's not gore. But it's just this kind of inevitable, horrible moment. And I I was pretty unnerved by it right right from the start of the film. Yeah, and it does in in a kind of uh, it, it's much different than the way that Don't Look Now presents the death of the daughter. Um, but it has a similarity in the sense of well, okay, so. In Don't Look Now, Donald Sutherland does have a psychic premonition of what's going to happen to his daughter. Mm -hmm. And in George C. Scott's case in The Changeling, it's not a premonition, but it's just this kind of unspeakable certainty that something horrible is going to happen. Um, Mm -hmm. And looking at the, you know, the mechanism in place that's going to make it happen and being unable to do anything about it. Right. Because he sees the giant truck kind of careening down the highway towards where his wife and child are and he just is he's he's across the street in a phone booth trying to call triple a or you know highway services or whatever um and it's just about that kind of like powerless in the face of the fate he knows is going to befall his family in the next 10 seconds exactly it's it's not it's it felt sort of like one of those dreams you have where you run but your legs just don't move forward and I think that kind of gets sealed at the end because after he watches the car run over his family, uh, the film freezes. We get a freeze frame of him in a phone booth over which the film's title is is flashed. Yeah, it's, so that even kind of just like emphasizes the like stuck. He can't move. He's he's just in this instant. Oh yeah, and and, it, and it, it's so brutal too because it is the second that it happens. It's just you're you're just there. <laughs> And, uh, and very cunningly uh, holds off until the moment that we actually see the car run into where the family is standing that we get George C. Scott's actual POV. Like until then, it's just kind of like shots of the truck. But then we get a wide angle from where he's standing of the truck, of the car just kind of being shoved over them. Uh, brutal fucking stuff. And and as good as the seance scene is, I feel like it's that's the one that's going to like give me the sweats at night is that that death scene. No, that's totally fair. And there, there's there's a couple sequences in this movie that are like that. Like it has an also um okay, you know what? Is it can I is it time to spoil more of the uh I think I think we've we've laid out our respective opinions. We're both pretty crazy about the film and it has a great say on scene and I think that that gets you into the the room if you needed to be convinced to watch it. So I think I think it's okay. I think we can pull the spoiler. Okay. Trigger. Yeah, spoiler alert. Um, although they think that the ghost in question is Cora, it's actually the ghost of Joseph, who um, is a... Okay, so he was... You know, he, he's he's a, a basically the, like, uh, attic stepchild who was born disabled and is in a wheelchair. Um, yes. And the thing... Basically, he gets murdered by his father... And replaced by a new child, um, and this this ha- this has to do with uh, the father trying to secure an inheritance from, I believe, the boy's maternal grandfather. Yes, um, and the new child is now the kind of like leading uh, politician in the area. He's a senator, right? Yeah, he, he he's a senator. He he's I don't I didn't pick up if he was a state senator or a U.S. senator, uh, because it seems very effortless for George C. Scott to go visit him. But also, it is possible that the Canadians don't appreciate that distinction. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, but yes, he is a... I mean, like, I, you ask me to write a story about a Canadian politician, and I'm just like, I don't know, Justin Trudeau goes to the maple syrup shop. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, it's, I'm no angel on this front. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, r- regardless, he is kind of the leading political figure in this town. He's held his office for over 30 years. He's this kind of, you know, man of the people, but he has this dark secret um that he's not even Play, played we must say by uh, melvin douglas who is who is a very iconic actor. yes um but yeah so anyway with the other the other like particularly brutal scene is the flashback to the drowning of the child mm-hmm. joseph which is mm-hmm. really prolonged and is also the answer to a particular mystery of the banging noise that george c scott keeps hearing reverberating throughout the house um, because it's, it's the, the kids, the kid like banging against the sides of the tub where he's being drowned by his father. And that is a r- ridiculously brutal moment. It is, uh, really, really effective. Just like showing shots of, of Joseph's hands, like, like in close up and just kind of flailing, uh, d- genuinely upsetting death scene. I mean, obviously 
anytime you see a child die on camera in a movie, it's upsetting. But this one is also like, well, like you said, it's prolonged. It goes on for probably 45 seconds, but it feels like you're watching it for like 10 minutes. Yeah. Because it's just ugly. Yeah. And the thing is, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a really incredibly violent moment, you know, without any gore or effects or anything. It's just, it's, it's hard to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, what else is going to say? I don't know. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, (laughs) what what were we talking about? (laughs) Uh, we were talking about, well, we spoiled the plot. Mm. Um, well, now that we have, is there anything you want to say about that reveal or the ending there? Uh, I mean, only sort of what I already touched on. I mean, I think there's, there's lots we could talk about, but the thing that really leapt out to me, um, this comes out in 1980, but it does absolutely feel like a hangover from the seventies type of movie mm-hmm. and that it, it, re, it all hinges on such a like needlessly small and petty and grubby human incident. Like a guy kills a son for money and then a boy grows up to become a powerful politician and hushes that up. It's, it's very cynical and caustic in the way that like a lot of those seventies political thrillers are. So I do think it feels like it's as descended from them as it is from, from like the haunting. Like there, there feels to me like you could just as easily put this on a, a double bill with the parallax view. I mean, (laughs) that's probably specifically bad example, but like that's where it feels like it's like a clute. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it feels like this is kind of the world that that movie is operating in every bit as much as it's operating in ghost story mode. And I, I like that about it. I think those are not two genres I would have expect to see collide. And they do so very smoothly. Yeah. And, and that kind of effortless blend is part of what makes the changeling so interesting, because if it was just a, you know, generic haunted house thriller, it, it would still be a very good haunted house movie because that's what it is. But as mm-hmm. you said, it's not so much about being a scary film so the fact that it does have so much else on its mind is what propels it beyond it's I, it's not a failure as a scary film it's just not particularly interested in scaring the audience except for certain moments right it it is it is very much a routine haunted house movie if if so it's 1980 if you've already seen the amityville horror you've seen a lot of the the specific gags this movie's going to try to pull in terms of like spooky things happening in the house um so it's it's not that it's a bad haunted house movie it's just that that's not something it's trying to excel at being uh, I think it's also worth pointing out if it were just a haunted house movie, it would most likely not have gotten George C. Scott because mm-hmm. George C. Scott is a he is an actor who was is it in 1980. He is not in the like, let's do genre movies phase that actors careers sometimes fall into. Um, this, this is not his trog. This is not his trog. Exactly. Uh, so you don't get him if it's just a genre film. And I think that would be a shame because I think he's really f- very good in this film like hot take George has got good acting crazy um and yeah that that is a kind of a vibe that a lot of the genre work he did would take because he was also in the exorcist 3 which is another film mm-hmm. that's very sober and interested in something you know uh, you actually you, you bandied about the the uh, controversial term elevated horror when we talked about don't look now but this is kind of in that same vein of mm-hmm. it does have something on its mind uh beyond just being a grubby little shocker Agreed. Agreed. And and much to its benefit. And and I, I think, you know, just to, to pull that, that dirty and much contested term into the light for a moment, elevated horror, uh, I think part of what, what's going on is that it in a film like The Changeling, it's not like a brand thing to do elevated horror, right? Like it's not like there's a it's not trying to fit a market niche, it's just oh, this is a good story to tell. We could we could do this, we could do it well and, and they do so. And I think that's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's not well because they they are making a horror film and they know that they are absolutely. Um, so it's it's not like they're trying to avoid the fact by you know with this veneer of stateliness. It's just a very stately horror movie that's in, intelligently mm-hmm. telling the story it wants to yeah. tell. Yeah, and and that's the thing. The story at no point feels like it takes a swerve that it didn't set me up for, even though it ends up being like this very strange genre mashup 
every step that gets us to that mashup feels inevitable almost yeah it, it's very it's a very holistically realized blend in general yes um but i will say i don't want to discount the scary moments because as much as um other than the scenes we already discussed you've said it hasn't really didn't really get to you there are some really solid moments that that do you know just enact those tropes well like the the part where he has his daughter's ball um with him Mm -hmm. and it inexplicably comes bouncing down the stairs one night and he immediately drives away and throws the ball into the river but the second he gets home the wet ball comes bouncing down the stairs at him again yes um and just the the execution of moments like that are really solid or um like there's a moment where his uh female companion i don't remember her name vera or laura or something like that claire claire yep who knows claire um she witnesses the the wheelchair at the top of the stairs but Mm -hmm. what you see in camera is the camera holding on her face for an almost excruciatingly long time as you watch her seeing something that's frightening her without telling us what she's seeing and mm-hmm. I, I think it's making a lot of choices that are making those moments incredibly effective, even if um, they're not going to scare a more seasoned horror viewer. Right. Um, when you mentioned the ball, it reminded me of another one of the scenes that I thought was actually very successful and good and and interesting in a horror movie, um, which is when he's he's in the house, he's, he's moving in, and I believe it's that he's unpacking and he finds his daughter's ball as he's unpacking. Mm-hmm. and And quite without setting anything up he's in the room with his daughter and she like tosses the ball at him Mm, yes and then and then his lady companion claire walks in and he sort of like shocks into a state of awakeness and we didn't even really realize he hadn't been awake i thought it was a a very great again insofar as this is about like fatherly grief uh really great scene but also really interesting to me in the context of a horror movie because it's It's uncanny and it's unsettling and it really disorients us. So even in a scene that is not in any way about, ooh, it's scary because it's not. It's a sad scene. Uh, But it's kind of using this like slippery reality in a way that that I think it gets to you because it's a horror film. So it's it's getting to pull in these things to do other things than that. So I think it's 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 very much having its cake and eating its too as far as it's like setting up scary moments and, and using that kind of visual language. Yeah, and it, it definitely excels in like the specifically the uncanny. Like, there's also a really effective moment where so he's been composing this new piece that ends up being revealed to be the tune of the music box that Joseph heard mm-hmm. as he was dying. Um, so once they find the music box and you realize it's playing the same song that he's already recorded, that's an incredibly uncanny moment too. That that scene, that whole sequence, both when he plays the music box and then when they're discussing it really phenomenal stuff i i was very everything about that sequence it's a very tropey moment the like something something that pushes them one step ahead in their their haunted house uh investigation but something about it just felt very right as a storytelling choice to me even though it objectively is just like holding the story in place for a minute so they can like spew some exposition at it but um the performances which were not like as we've talked about it's not like oh god it's so scary what's going on in my house it's like curiosity it's a mystery it's a way to keep his brain going um everything about that sequence just really i really liked yeah and and also there's something really compelling about a composer being the center of a horror film that Mm -hmm. a lot of italian movies have also harnessed Mm -hmm. Um, But there's something really special about somebody being alone, playing minor key music while something creepy is happening around them. (laughs) That's incredibly effective. Yes. Um, But also, what was I going to say? (laughs) Sorry, I am off my ball. My, wow. Wow. Off, who knows? Off your balls, I get it. You know what? Bad I'm just not gonna. Me. I'm just not gonna cut this part. Um, anyway, so you say something to me. Uh, one of the things I would like to talk about, you know, we've we've sort of touched on the story about how it becomes, you know, this the genre film and not. Um, I was quite taken with with the filmmaking in this, uh, and in particular, mm-hmm. 
the very, very grainy cinematography. And I, I sort of seeded in the idea, this feels like a TV director's first movie in a way. And I don't know if that's his first movie. but um, it, it is not, but it's, it's his okay. first it, and only truly extremely notable movie. Okay. But it, it still feels like it has a level of, not low budget because it's not, but there's a sort of, I think like a raw, like a rough quality to it. And I think that really especially shows up in the cinematography, which feels kind of crude and kind of like lo-fi, but in a really good way. And and it's just so grainy and it's, it's very striking in a, a way. It's, it's not a pretty movie. Like it's not badly shot at all. It's quite well shot, but it's kind of gross and ugly in a lot of ways. And I think that fits in with the emotions at play so very well that I just, I found that really bracing in a way, uh, especially right from the start when it's the, the, the winter scene and, and the, the wife and daughter are dying. Um, and it's just like, it, it's so grainy that it almost looks like the sky is foggy with grain. So I was curious if you had any thoughts about like that or, or the film's construction in general. No, that's, that's a really good point because like I said, uh, like I have pointed out specific filmmaking moments that are extremely effective. Like in, in, in the craft of how these moments are put together, it is, it is entirely intentional and knows what it's doing. Um, but the, the, the things that you're looking at, you're right. It's not about the like picturesque beauty of grief or of Seattle or whatever. It's this very, I wouldn't say it's a documentarian style, but the the fact that it does feel so kind of raw and unpolished, it especially highlights the brutality of those especially rough moments. Um, you just, you feel more like you are just, standing there while this is happening because it doesn't it's, it's not at a remove aesthetically and i think that's probably one of the, the ways i would very clearly draw a line between this and uh and separating this from don't look mm-hmm. now is that that that's a very aestheticized movie like it's it creates these sort of like very painterly boxes for its characters to sort of feel like they're they're getting lost in this is not that like this is you know peter medak is not Nick Reg, you know, it's, it's just very, um, it's, it's, it lacks that sort of like, as you said, polish. And I, I think, I think to its benefit, I think that that's, it's a, it's a brutal movie, like emotionally brutal. We talked about the very brutal, we see two children die on screen in this movie. Uh, and I think it's a good look for that. Yes. And, and another thing that I love about the emotions is that, you know, George C. Scott is, well, he, he's, he's Patton, you know, he's this like big, strong man and you do get to see him weeping in this movie. There, there's a moment where he's just lying in bed crying, um, mm-hmm. which then gets interrupted by a, a spooky moment. But it, it doesn't shy away from the harder facts of what he's going through. Um, and also, I think that this is authentic to his emotional space in his character they they don't even try to imply a romance with the female character he's thrown together with mm-hmm. which i i think is a really really smart choice i agree and and maybe this is me talking out my ass that's one of the things that feels canadian to me like i, I feel like you see more canadian genre films that don't feel obliged to hook up their leads than i think you do necessarily american genre films that's an interesting point i'd have to you know, think back on on my history, but I I will go with you on that one. And also, another thing about the fact of this movie being Canadian is, as much as it's set in Seattle, um, but mostly filmed in Vancouver, I believe. Um, it so many Canadian films have such a specificity of place um, mm-hmm. that, especially like you know the original My Bloody Valentine. Um, which was shot, you know, in an actual mining town. But like, there, there's something extremely tactile and just realistic about the way that a lot of Canadian films present their setting, even if it's pretending to be in America, which most of them are. Mm-hmm. Most of them are. Um, but most of them, it's it's very everything's very fleshed out and colorful, and it just feels like a space you can walk through. Um, and I think that applying that kind of sense to a haunted house, you know, even though it's, it's mostly interiors, like I, I think it gets that across. Mm-hmm. No, I completely agree with that. And I think that's part of what, what both makes it work as a haunted house movie and to a certain extent makes it to me a little less scary. But again, I just, I don't think being scary is one of this film's goals. Uh, but it, it really f- 
gets at the like what is going on in the house as a just kind of like fact to cope with rather than necessarily it's not like full of you know deep expressionist shadows trying to make us feel like the house is this threatening place it's just a house but it's a house where things are wrong and and i feel like that kind of hits harder or hits differently at least Mm -hmm. since it does feel like a house and not a movie set Yes, very much. You're you're totally right, and and th- that's where those those kind of two ideas come together. Because it, it's mm. it's not this kind of grand over gothic thing. And as much as right. I love that type of design, yeah, I was just gonna say like I I will bow to no one in my love of the haunting, but that's a movie set. That's not a building. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's lo- that's a back lot. Uh, this is not this. This is well, yeah. Continue. And, well, and this sensibility is specifically in the service of that more political kind of gritty story that it's telling, because it's not telling mm-hmm. like a big bombastic, you know, like story of an ancient evil. It is a very grubby, simple revenge story at the core of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and speaking of the the closing scene is this wild crescendo of special effects that doesn't it doesn't go overboard but it is this very exciting um kind of genre-fied moment at the, like fitting into the end of the movie yeah the, the movie has been holding off i think on that moment because it wants to it's keeping its uh, it's powder dry as it were you mm-hmm. know it wants to make sure that when it hits its climax when it shoves us out of the movie it has tricks up its sleeve that we won't have gotten bored with or we won't have gotten used to so it can still actually use them and have them land for us yeah and we actually we haven't actually mentioned what's probably the most famous scene in this movie which is the wheelchair chasing uh claire around the top story of the house did you find that effective at all um i mean i was on the movie's side enough that i would say that i did if you if you showed that to me and said this is the most famous scene from this movie it would not have necessarily convinced me that i should watch this movie also i think it's a shame that that's a more famous scene than the seance scene because that's a good ass yeah scene. I, but. I agree um it i think it, you're right it's, it's effective in context but out of context it's a little silly it's a little silly but again it's by that point the movie i was rooting for the movie mm-hmm. and once i'm rooting for a movie i will forgive visual effect sequences or special effect sequences that don't quite have all of their ducks in a row. Yeah. You know? like, but, but at least, you know, that's not the final scene in the movie. The final scene is the, you know, the stair railing on fire chandelier mm-hmm. swinging wildly above George C. Scott and just sprinkling crystals like rain on top of him. Right. With, with this, that scene has a very thunderous sound mix too. Like it's, it's, really going for it on the soundtrack which this movie soundtrack in general is is quite loud in a way that i think is is very good and works for it yeah and it, it does have i think this is something we talked about in the haunting as well where it kind of has an almost tinny otherworldly quality to the mm. sound effect or maybe we talked about this in carnival of souls they definitely had that situation for sure um where it doesn't sound necessarily real but that actually kind of highlights how weird the noises you're hearing are absolutely absolutely um so oh, is there anything else you want to specifically bring up about the changeling? I mean, the things I really wanted to specifically bring up, we've talked about, uh, I think it's just really damn good. I think it's a good movie. And I, I think it's one of those good movies that is both, if you don't like genre films, there's still a lot going on that makes this worthwhile. Again, like if, if you're a fan of like a Clute type movie, this feels like it's scratching that itch for me a little bit. So it's both, very good if you like horror and i think very good if you don't like horror and and it's nice to have one of those to to be able to recommend out into the world yeah and it's it's challenging to straddle both of those lines but it really it it does exist in two different worlds in a lot of different ways and it very effectively combines everything mhm i completely agree um and yeah i i'm i'm so glad that you liked it um i hope we get to do I mean, you know, we're in charge of this, so like we can't if we want. We can, we can do um, this every month if we wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this was a really exciting kind of uh, experiment in bringing movies, and I'm always excited to be able to share something with you for the first time. But having it be oh, the changeling was yeah. an honor, sir. Yeah, no, it was it was a large gap in my viewing history, and I'm I'm very happy to have filled that gap. Yeah. Um. Oh, and oh, oh, I almost forgot. 
Um, last time, you know, my, my gap being filled in was Don't Look Now. And last episode, I said I was going to seek out the short story Don't Look Now and see if I appreciated it ah, anymore. Yes. And I did. I read the short story. Uh, or, no, no, uh, I read the audiobook. It's like a two-hour audiobook, so it's like longer than a short story, shorter than a novella. Um, but I think Don't Look Now, um, it, it was a very faithful adaptation. I, I do think that, obviously, there's more detail added in the movie. Um, the idea of basically him restoring the church and actually working in Venice is not in the short story. Um, okay. They are just on vacation. Um. But they actually make the thing that you said about the sex scene being a reaction to her kind of getting her life back is very explicit in the book. Um, And I would say that the book is in general more explicit about the ways that the character is handling his grief and the way and the way that that arc is progressing because the the movie is more elliptical about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But generally, it's kind of a one to one (laughs) situation. It does start with a very hard to read transphobic series of jokes which was strange okay but you know that's unfortunate that's just it's it's the time period you know de Mar- de was a nice english lady of a certain generation yeah exactly um but it does it does end in a very similarly abrupt way of yeah, like that that ending is the exact ending of the short story like you said and it, it's fascinatingly peculiar in any in any iteration <laughs> Sure. sure. Um, yeah, so that's me reporting back on that. D- d- does it does it move the needle for you on Don't Look Now, the movie? Uh, no. Um, mm. I actually, I mean, I do think I like the movie more than I like the short story. Um, okay. Even though the, well, you know, that the short story is more clear on the arc that it's making, but that's not necessarily a good thing. I, I would almost go the opposite i would say it's it's not necessarily a bad thing but it's probably a bad thing yeah and even more so the movie i understood even if i didn't enjoy the movie i understood what it was doing and why it was doing it um reading the short story i was more i just it didn't click with me why this short story needed to be written and published i was just like it doesn't feel like it's delivering anything to me okay um gotcha and i actually I didn't love the bird short story either. I might not like Daphne du Maurier. <laughs> I have only read Rebecca. Did you like Rebecca? So I, I did. Okay. I'll, I'll check out like Rebecca, Rebecca at some point. But the the shorts so far have not been doing it. Anyway. Good to know. Uh, that was more Don't Look Now. Also, we did the Changeling. We're pretty much covered. Yeah. F- unfortunately, Changeling not based on a novel at all, let alone a Daphne du Maurier one. I know. So. What a shame. We, we we had all the other connections that we could, though. Yes. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's going to conclude our super special unseen Halloween month. Um, for next month, we're going to be rounding out the horn with our final uh, Patreon request of uh, 2021. So we're just going to do one episode on this particular topic. Um, but that's going to be Carl Beasley's topic, Terrors of the Deep. Um, look for that poll coming up on the Patreon for everyone who's uh, subscribed to the Patreon. Uh, you will get to vote on that. I will probably run the poll towards the final week of October so Tim and I can prep that episode in early November and have a little bit of a head start on it. Um, but keep an eye out for that. I'm, I'm very excited for that particular discussion. Yes, indeed. Uh, Terrors of the Deep just just being about like the horrible things in the ocean that will kill you. And there's plenty of them. So many of them. But anyway, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, This is the last episode before before Halloween, so I hope you have a good Halloween. That's right. Happy Halloween, everybody. Um, Tim, do you have any Halloween plans? Uh, None whatsoever. Ooh, okay. I will will probably be grading on Halloween. I think we have a speech that week. That's fair. Um, yeah, life goes on. Do you have a specific movie you want to watch around Halloween, even if it's not on Halloween? Uh, well, potentially. Uh, I just just this week uh, picked up the Disney Movie Club exclusive Blu-ray of Something Wicked This Way Comes, the Ooh. Disney family horror film from the early 80s. Uh, and I haven't seen it in a lot of years, so I'm going to try to make sure I, I watch that sometime this October. I love that. Also, you can keep an eye out on Tim's Letterboxd. Um, and of course, and yeah, my Halloween tradition is that every year 
I pick a movie and my boyfriend picks a movie. Um, and so this year I'm showing Ben The Sixth Sense for the first time, which I'm very excited uh, for. Does Does he know? He does not. How is that possible? Um, it is a very specific combination of he was too young for the movie when it came out and for the discourse when it came out um, and has a terrible memory. So somebody's probably told him and then he forgot. Okay, good. Good. Um, so I'm trying to, to keep him pure until the moment. <laughs> um, and we're also going to be – he picked out a Final Destination for us to watch, so I'm excited to do that double okay. feature. So so he was not trying as hard as you were to to find something that would be new for you, then, I take it. No, no, no. Uh, he he wanted to start a new franchise marathon, and I gave him okay. many options off of my shelf, and that's the one he chose. I mean, honestly, as franchises go, that's one that I have a fairly warm disposition towards. Yes, it's that is one of the horror franchises where I could watch any of those movies and be perfectly satisfied. Even the shitty fourth and, one. And, and I was going to say, any is a big word, but yes. I think... I find the the terrible fourth one to be an almost like fundamental just silly horror movie in a in in a way that I like. I don't know. It's dumb. I will say that not that this is how you'll be watching it. It does have a certain like huckstery pleasure when you're watching it in 3D cuz it's it's mm. shameless 3D. Yes, and also it it's um you know, it's, it's very fabulistic, Tim, because none of the characters yes. have names, pretty much. They're all called, like, the truck driver, the racist. <laughs> um, no, it's a bad movie, but it's I find it fun. And also, the most of the men in it are shirtless most of the time, so it works that, for me. That is, that is accurate. Anyway, that's the end of this episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, have a great spooky season. Bye. Bye, everybody.